Hello, everyone. My name is Hilary Proctor, and I'm from Making Sense International. I am pleased to welcome all of you to the Soft Skills Development in Conflict and Crisis Settings webinar. Today, we are going to hear about the challenges and lessons learned from three different presenters. We will hear from Matt Strang from Mercy Corps, Andrew Matthew from IRC, and Sylvia Carlson from the Search from Common Ground. We are also going to have a chance to hear from Olga Merchant and Nina Weisenhorn from USAID's E3 Education Bureau to help us frame our conversation about soft skills and conflict. Before we get started, I would like to share with you a little information about the Youth Power Learning Project. The Youth Power Learning Project focuses on identifying the research and findings necessary to improve the capacity of youth-led and youth-serving institutions and programs. Youth Power Learning does this through embodying a positive youth development approach that recognizes the needs to develop youth assets, agencies, contributions, and to be surrounded by an enabling environment in order to allow for their transition to adulthood. How to be involved with youth power learning? Well, there's lots of different ways. We encourage you to visit the youthpower.org website to be able to learn about more information and various events. There is also a page called What Works that identifies a lot of the latest research and findings from many different topics that engage youth. There is also several communities of practice outside of the cross-sectoral skills for youth that we encourage everyone to join. So now that everyone is familiar with youth power learning, I'd like us to move to our own conversation. With that, I will hand it over to Olga and Nancy. Or, I'm sorry, Anita. Thank you, Hillary. This is Olga Martina. I think you're through um, your microphone is you. Oh, hi. Welcome, everyone. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, we're so glad to have everyone with us this afternoon. As you know, at USAID in the uh, Office of Education, in 2011, we set out uh, three bold goals. Uh, ambitious goal to in, improve education and youth programming across USA's global portfolio. Uh, that strategy set out three main goals, and today we're going to focus on the second two goals. We'll be looking at the uh, improved ability of tertiary and workforce development programs to generate workforce skills relevant to the country's development goals and our third goal on increased equitable access to children and young people in crisis and conflict affected countries. Across all of our, our goal areas, we also set out to ensure broad integration of four key themes related to gender, disability, technology, and finance. And as we look back over the six to seven years of the current strategy, we've achieved a lot, especially when we look at our education in crisis and conflict programs and our youth programs. We've been able to reach over 12 million unique children and youth beneficiaries and increasing access for 2.4 million children who otherwise wouldn't have been able to access education opportunities. And those education opportunities range from both formal education in primary and lower secondary education, as well as non-formal education that builds young people's skills in literacy, numeracy, and other workforce readiness programs. In our workforce development programs with youth, we were also able to uh, support young people to gain new or better employment uh, upwards of 600,000 young people. And across the, the spectrum of our programs, we've made significant learning. First, we've, we've been able to see that societies with educated, 
skilled workforce are more stable, prosperous, and democratic. Based on USA's research on resilience and sustainable poverty escapes in Uganda, Bangladesh, and Ethiopia, we've seen that educational attainment is a strong predictor of whether a household escapes poverty and will stay out of poverty in the face of shocks and stresses. And this is especially critical for the current state in which our, our programs are operating, where we see that there are more crises and man-made conflicts affecting not just the parties to the conflict, but also young people, children, and communities more directly. At the same time, we know that an extra year of schooling will increase productivity for the individual and have broad-based economic uh, outcomes and growth for the society as a whole. In addition, we've learned through our USAID-funded research in Afghanistan and in other places that through community-based education, communities have increased confidence in their government and improved perceptions of state legitimacy. So while, um, and while we know that education is a critical component to achieving these cross-sectoral outcomes, we also have learned that it is, needs to be part of an integrated and cross-sectoral program that no single sector youth intervention alone will be able to achieve these outcomes. So when we look across our portfolio of education and youth programming in crisis and conflict affected environments, we see it's increasingly important to look at a cross-sectoral approach that may include flexible education offerings, non-formal pathways to education and training, and integrate a range of learning outcomes beyond just literacy and numeracy, but stretches to include other skills, such as soft skills, which we'll learn more about today. And then we also have learned that participatory, gender-transformative approaches are critical for reaching invisible communities who have traditionally been hard to reach with our youth programs. By taking a equity-based approach in our programs and really looking at who is being marginalized and how they are being excluded from education systems, it will help us to better program our resources to reach those who have otherwise been left out of the system. And if you can see there on your screen a few key resources if you want to delve into a little bit deeper any of these uh, key points. So what are soft skills? I'm going to toss it over to Olga to go through the next, this next part. So when we are talking about soft skills, we use the following definition when you see on your screen right now. It's about soft skills is a process of skills, competencies, behaviors, attitudes, and personal qualities that enable people to effectively navigate their environment, work well with others, perform well, and achieve their goals. Okay. Um, this diagram that you guys have seen is from a report by Youth Power Action that was published in 2016 and that built on previous work done by USAID Workforce Connection uh, Project. Youth Power Action conducted a literature review to identify uh, key skills related to sexual and reproductive health outcomes and those related to preventing uh, violence. So there are three soft skills uh, that you can see in the middle in that, uh, in that uh, dark blue that are shown to support positive outcomes in workforce, violence prevention, and sexual reproductive health. Uh, so the first one, then in the positive self-concept, it is including, it is included uh, self-confidence, self-efficacy, self-awareness and belief, and a sense of well-being and pride, uh, a healthy identity, and awareness of one's strength. The second one, self-control, refers to one's um, ability to delay gratification, uh, control impulses, and 
uh, manage emotions and regulate behavior. For example, someone with a high uh, proficiency in, in, in self control is able to be punctual and is also able to uh, focus on tasks and manage their behavior by destruction or incentives to do uh, to otherwise. Self control is foundational uh, to social skills, communication. Being hardworking and dependable, uh, be able to work in teams, uh, show leadership skills, problem solving, critical thinking, and decision making. And last but not least, inherently uh, cognitive skills, which is a uh, higher order thinking skill, which includes uh, decision making, uh, critical thinking, and problem solving. As we are talking about soft skills and the importance to the topic of BE, we would like to highlight, highlight some of the evidence for specific soft skills and mitigating violent behaviors and attitudes. Uh, from the analysis conducted, uh, conducted on soft skills and positive use outcomes under youth power action, there are uh, certain skills that have strong linkages to results are related to violence prevention. And we are um, defining violence here as including aggressive behaviors, bullying, violent crime, group or uh, gang violence, and intimate partner uh, violence. And the top five skills with this evidence are self-control, empathy, social skills, higher skills, and positive self -conscious. Some of the key findings from the research pertinent to this presentation are, number one, the link between the soft skills, the, sorry, the soft skill of self-control and violent prevention has the strongest and most extensive support in uh, in literature. So strong evidence in, uh, in self-control with violence prevention. There is strong evidence of association between lack of self-control and aggressive behavior in childhood and adolescence. Positive self-concept and identity in youth with, with a high self-esteem may affect their uh, interest in aggressive behavior. But in some instances, it can also support um, aggressive behavior. Empathy, there is substantial evidence that this contributes to violence prevention. But uh, this not figure as a key uh, skill for other uh, outcomes, for example, in reproductive health or work. So we wanted to emphasize again the value of integrating skill development into uh, programming because these are skills that can be targeted and are malleable in youth, meaning that uh, youth skills can change over time. They are not fixed if you, uh, if you don't exhibit those skills um, earlier. That's the youth here. Okay, so as we as USAID looks ahead towards our future programming, we're in a period of transition right now as we uh, align to the current agency priorities. And within this, for young people in crisis and conflict affected environments, we see that soft skills development is a critical part of how we're advancing the agency's priorities, specifically when it comes to integration of our youth and development policy into our, uh, our work in humanitarian context, in our work to promote sustainable development and, a peace, and peace around the world, and as we expand young women's equal access to opportunities and participation in their host country institutions. In addition, specifically within the Office of Education, we are designing and rolling out new learning agendas 
And for the Education and Crisis and Conflict team, we have specifically focused on two key areas that are re relevant for young people and soft skills development. We have uh, two key questions related to student well-being, which is really focused on understanding what education intervention, interventions are most effective in improving student well-being in crisis and conflict contexts. And we understand that soft skills, just as Olga previously mentioned, is critical to uh, improving a young person's sense, sense of well-being. The second key question that we're looking at is understanding what is the impact of well-being interventions on student learning outcomes in crisis and conflict settings. And when we talk about learning outcomes, we're looking to really expand our definition of learning outcomes to include not just our traditional literacy or numeracy skills, but what are the other measurable skills and learning that we can demonstrate through improved research, evidence, and monitoring of our program. The second bucket of area where we're looking to learn more about is around equity. And when we look at the number of young people who are excluded from education opportunities, this is a critical area for uh, greater research and it, where we've seen through past literature reviews that there's a dearth of understanding on how and under what conditions we can effectively integrate and improve uh, access to education opportunities for young people in crisis and conflict contexts. And we're specifically looking at the role that accelerated education plays in this environment and how it can more effectively improve learning outcomes, retention, and completion of education opportunities in crisis and conflict environments. At the same time, we're also developing a learning agenda with, our youth, uh, with a youth focus. And this will include uh, consultations with other partners, and we look forward to en engaging you in that process. Uh, and what, but what we see right now is that under our youth agenda, uh, we really see a convergence coming together with our priorities in the education and crisis and conflict space, and looking to understand better how opportunities to learn can be more effective for young people in, in, in settings affected by crisis, and what are the conditions necessary to better serve young people in these contexts. As we advance this agenda, I also want to highlight an opportunity with one of our other communities of practice, the Education and Crisis and Conflict Network, who will be hosting a policy roundtable on social and emotional learning in crisis and conflict environments uh, at the end of May or beginning of June. So if you're not a member, please join that community of practice as well, and we look forward to ensuring that the, the discussions at that policy roundtable cover the gamut from our early childhood and primary school age children all the way through the necessary tools and resources needed to build soft skills for young people in these contexts. Thank you. All right. Uh, over to Andrew. Great, thank you very much. Am I audible? Am I visible? Perfect. <laughs> audible but not visible. Not visible. I do have my camera on. Might need to click share. Yes, I do. There we go. Okay, okay well thanks very much uh, Nina and Olga and, and thanks um, generally for this opportunity to to talk about the, the IRC's approach to soft skills in, in crisis and conflict settings, and particularly uh, how we're approaching these in our programming for youth and adolescents, which, as we um, broaden our traditional aspects to, to livelihoods training, for example, and, and in the education sector, continue to build on the work we've done with school-aged children, um, it's an exciting and developing uh, area for us. Now, as, as Nina and Olga said, soft skills um, are well established in the research literature as a key predictor of success and well-being, um, and indeed of resiliency, um, and essential for establishing positive developmental trajectories and turning youth away from, from negative behaviors such as increased 
risk taking. At the IRC, uh, our approach to soft skills for youth is very much driven out of our work on social and emotional learning, SEL, um, and its application in conflict and crisis settings. It's fair to say that SEL is a major technical priority for the IRC. Now, when we, um, all of us, think of education, we often think of academic outcomes such as improving um, reading and math, especially for, for the younger years. Um, and at the IRC, we, we absolutely do this, but we are equally focused on social and emotional learning. Um, approaching that area, if you like, as a set of soft skills <clears throat> central to positive youth development goals, um, uh, building assets, giving agency and an ability to contribute to, to positive change. So briefly, um, I want to talk a little to answer the question, why social and emotional learning, and explain what SEL is as the IRC conceives it. Um, and then what we know, what does the evidence say about the effectiveness of social and emotional learning skills on academic and other life outcomes, and what does SEL for us look like in practice? What have we learned from our SEL programming? How are we applying it to our work with youth and adolescents? Um, and if time permits, what's next? What developments are we looking to push forward, and what do we still want to know? At the IRC, we focus as a priority on conflict and crisis contexts. So every child and youth who we support has witnessed or experienced some type of violence, war or displacement, and extreme poverty. The statistics are striking. You can see some of them here. One in four children currently live in countries affected by conflict and disaster. 62 million of these have no access to school. A billion children globally have experienced some sort of violence in the home. We now have increasing evidence from developmental neuroscience to show us in very concrete ways how children's brains are actually altered and damaged by prolonged or repeated exposure to these multiple types of adversity. This it can cause children and young people to experience what is known as toxic stress, which is to say levels of stress that have risen well beyond what is normal and beyond what is tolerable. And this damages their physical and mental health, their behavior, their relationships, their ability to learn. The picture may be a little hard to see, but you can possibly make out the areas of the brain that are affected by toxic stress when exposed to chronic repeated violence and adversity. Um, I can point out two. On the right, you can see that toxic stress impacts the basic cognition processes that are fundamental for learning. These include memory, the ability to remember information, and focus, as in the ability to control and to manage information without distraction, and impulse control, the ability to manage emotions and self-regulate. Now, all of these I'm sure you'll agree, are foundational and core to being able to learn. The, the other area to note is that, is, the, is that which governs social processes on the left. Children and youth's ability to trust, to form attachments, not to go into flight or fight mode, um, and so have the kind of friendships and relationships with teachers and peers that are necessary to keep motivated, to manage conflict, to persevere at a task, to stay in school, to sign up for a training program, for, for example. Um, as everyone is well aware, in the past several years, the educational sector has made a significant shift from focusing almost exclusively on increasing access to education to emphasizing learning outcomes and quality. The definition of learning and quality, though, has, has tended to be limited to reading and math in the early grades of primary school. Working in countries affected by war and cyclical violence and through the implementation of the IRC's healing classrooms approach, we've sought to emphasize the key role that education plays, not only in providing children and youth with academic skills, those skills they require to succeed as adults, but also in developing the social and emotional skills they need to cope with the consequences of crisis and violence in their daily lives. And it's equipped with these coping skills that children and youth can become more resilient, active members of society. So to sum this up, during conflict and crisis, children, adolescents, and youth are exposed to multiple severe adversities 
which is violence, abuse, displacement, and an absence of support from families and communities. We know from neuroscience that frequent or prolonged exposure to such adversities without uh, protective relationships can result in a toxic stress response, which unaddressed will have a, a damaging effect on children's brain development and it, over time will negatively impact overall health, and well-being, and the ability to learn. We also know that the frequency and severity of exposure to violent events is related to higher levels of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. But we also know that children are resilient. Evidence shows that the effect of toxic stress can be mitigated or even reversed by ensuring that children and youth have a safe, predictable environment with supportive relationships with their families and peers. What will also build resilience and mitigate the impact of toxic stress in the development of social and is the sorry is the development of social and emotional skills and competencies. Social and relationship skills, um, for example, that will facilitate healthier, more positive relationships and strengthen social bonds through the ability to manage better negative emotions and um, feel empathy, or to process skills in conflict resolution or to exercise improved focus and attention, to set goals, to persevere, to delay gratification. So in essence, in the prolonged uh, or repeated exposure to, it's, the, it's this prolonged or repeated exposure to violence, along with the lack of a nurturing caregiver, and we can add poverty to this, that will bring about damaging levels of toxic stress and in the conflict-affected environments in which we work, this is a perfect storm of stresses that can result in real damage. Children and youth around the world who witness or experience violence need a secure and safe and predictable place in which they can learn and grow and thrive in order to mitigate the, the impact of this adversity. But what is positive is that this can be mitigated, and this is the... Um, where the learning of social and emotional skills has a key part to play. I want to say a little bit more about the developmental neuroscience which underpins this, uh, because it's very interesting, and how age, um, in the sense of developmental stages, influences our approach. Um, Brains develop at an astonishing rate. This is becoming increasingly clear. In our very early years, they say you know, up to a million neural pathways can be formed per second. This rapid rate of growth intensifies the impact of the environment and experience on the brain development, um, which means that the, the connections and interactions of young children with caregivers and the world around them uh, helps to stimulate and strengthen the brain architecture. But while the early years of a child's brain development are central, our brain is always developing. So it's now clear that in adolescent years and beyond, the brain retains a high degree of what's known as neural plasticity, um, which is to say it's still developing. And you can see this represented in the picture. What this means is that there's an opportunity beyond the early years to form or repair neural connections. In particular, the prefrontal cortex, where executive functions, meaning the capacity, for example, to analyze and take rational decisions or to control impulses, reduce risky behavior, where this develops, this is the last part of the brain to form fully in, in adulthood. So the capacity for learning and exploring is at an all-time high and is critical to helping adolescents and youth navigate the transition to adulthood. So at the IRC, we apply a developmental age-related lens to all our approaches in education and training, focusing our attention on what's happening in specific developmental stages and what children or youth most need at those critical stages. And we know from science that the adolescent and young adult years, with all the additional stresses, risks, and responsibilities that come from exposure to conflict or displacement, are still an opportunity, a second opportunity, as, as some have termed it. That is to say, for adolescents and youth, the transition to adulthood actually takes a lot longer than many people think um, and is much more than a transition phase. The brains of adolescents and youth are still subject to the influences and experiences around them, including the therapeutic psychosocial impact of social and emotional skill development. And so youth in crisis and conflict need particular attention and support to develop their full potential as healthy and mentally well adults. 
So this opportunity is there, but it's also a responsibility for, for youth in situations of risk are at a time in their lives when decisions they make will have momentous consequences. So what do we know? Like younger children then, youth are resilient. And what's really exciting and encouraging for us is that there's a lot of evidence that shows now the effect of toxic stress can be mitigated, damage can be repaired with social and emotional learning programs. That SEL can bring about positive social behaviors, improved attitudes about the self, improved attitudes about others, uh, reduce conduct problems, and reduce aggression. And what's more uh, is that by teaching youth these skills in safe and nurturing and predictable environments, we can see significant improvements in social and emotional skills and in learning outcomes. There are foundational studies now which have had a, a decisive impact on the development of SEL in schools here in the United States, for example, that have established that programs teaching social and emotional skills in the same way that reading and math are taught, stay explicitly sequenced, structured, can bring about um, up to an 11% improvement in academic achievement. But what I want to note quickly is that this research is rich and deep in countries uh, with high incomes, but lacking entirely, almost, in conflict and fragile contexts. Um, there have been something like 227 rigorous studies carried out to measure learning in low and middle income countries, and only five, perhaps, rigorous experimental education studies in crisis settings. So to ensure that our SEL programs are, are helping children and youth gain the essential skills they need to learn and succeed, we need to build this evidence. We need to build the evidence base and ensure that we're evaluating and learning from our programs. So how are we seeking to do this at the IRC and what are the implications for our work with youth? As I noted, the evidence base is, is slight but growing. I want to say something now about how we're seeking to expand this and then how we're applying SEL in our work with youth. I must mention here, even a few years ago now, the OPEC USAID funded project that we ran in the RC. Um, because this was the first and only large scale RCT on social and emotional learning in conflict crisis contexts. We worked with 350 schools and over 480,000 children. And it, it showed quickly that a curriculum with integrated social and emotional learning could have a positive impact on learning outcomes in these environments. Moving um, forward from this, we've continued to focus on, a, on sequenced and explicit instruction of social and emotional skills. And then we've invested a lot in the development of fidelity measures so that we can build the evidence base on what works to improve conflict-affected children's social and emotional skills and learning and understand how and where and under what conditions and at what cost. Um, second uh, area of, of knowledge development for us um, has been our participation in the Education and Emergencies Evidence for Action Research Consortium, um, led by New York University, um, with support from Dubai Cares. Um, and here we were conducting work into combinations of SEL skills with IRC's healing classroom approach um, in both Lebanon and uh, Niger. Um, we're testing low-cost targeted SEL interventions um, and in order to understand that what components of SEL are having what impacts. Combining mindfulness with reading and math, for example. Mindfulness in the sense of short activities that focus on relaxation techniques to slow children's thoughts and focus on the present moment rather than the past or the future. Um, and uh, brain games. Um, aiming to develop executive function, they need to be fun, they need to be motivating, they need to be physically engaging often, um, building and practicing executive function and self-regulation, and all of these are easily integrated into, into classroom instruction. Um, feeding, uh, I want to say something about um, this as well, so feeding into this is also work on measurement, um, and includes a component to develop measurement tools. Um, which maybe we can come back to. So what does uh, SEL look like for the IRC based on this learning, based on what we know? Um, so as we push forward with our research agenda and, and expand the application of our SEL programs, including to, to adolescents and youth, we've settled on a curriculum that targets five essential social and emotional competencies 
um, either as a complete suite or in, in various combinations, as I say. That is something we are exploring in our research. Um, explicit activities can be infused into academic curricula or, um, as we'll see in a minute, brought in to enhance livelihoods and protection interventions. Um, but across these five competencies, we aim to cover emotional processes, uh, for example, emotion recognition, empathy, perspective taking, social and interpersonal processes, in this case meaning interpreting others' behavior correctly, communicating clearly, respecting others, and uh, those we might categorize under cognitive processes. For example, working memory, and inhibiting inappropriate responses, um, attention control or focus, and higher level executive functioning skills. So in what remains, I'd like to give quick, uh, three quick examples um, of how we're applying our experience and growing knowledge of social and emotional learning to our work with youth. I want firstly to mention our Girl Shine approach. Um, <clears throat> our programming for adolescent girls has now resulted in a, in a program model and a curriculum that seeks to support, to protect, um, and empower adolescent girls in humanitarian settings. The goal is to reduce risk and increase safety for adolescent girls who live in fragile settings um, where we know the incidents of violence against, against them are staggeringly high. Um, and the approach here is through an, an adaptable program model that can be used in multiple settings, including conflict uh, and natural disasters, um, as well as in the various phases of an emergency response. It's developed out of DFID funded programs, uh, COMPASS, implemented and tested in conflict affected and displaced refugee populations in Pakistan, Ethiopia, and the DRC. Um, and alongside sessions to build trust, knowledge of health and hygiene, safety, particularly in relationships, um, FEL skill building activities cover stress management, conflict resolution, decisions making, um, relationship skills, and self-awareness skills around emotions. We've incorporated the Girl Shine curriculum in, in our theories of change and program designs which, for targeting adolescent girls, um, both in and out of school um, in order further to enhance the development of these protective assets as an aspect of reducing barriers to educational access that are created for girls by the prevalence of violence and insecurity in and around schools. Second example comes from our um, work on livelihoods and training. Here we bring soft skills in the form of SEL into uh, our signature livelihoods programming, Learn to Earn. The, this is the IRC's package of materials that provide youth and other vulnerable beneficiaries with transferable business and life skills, um, preeminently market-relevant entrepreneurship training. We do this in a couple of ways. Um, we do it through explicit FEL instruction, which, um, by which I mean targeted activities that focus on the IRC FEL competency framework that provide overarching holistic psychosocial support, emotional regulation at individual level, for example, empathy building and communication skills um, at the level of interaction with family and peers, and at the community level. And as well as strengthening uh, focus and short-term memory use, goal setting, and perseverance for enhanced um, learning of skills. And then secondly, we, we do it through the integration of, of SEL principles into the training of facilitators and instructors, um, as enshrined in our healing classroom approach. So we create a safe, supportive e learning environment, an enabling environment, um, with the emphasis on predictability, inclusion, and the skills of engagement and support. Thirdly and finally, uh, I'd like to say just something very quickly. Um, about our SAFE toolkit, currently under construction, um, an ongoing project with the support of OFDA for the support of adolescents roughly 10 to 19 um, in the acute phase of emergencies, so supporting adolescents and their families in emergencies. 
It builds on our existing SHLS uh, toolkit, that's Safe Healing and Learning Spaces, for school-aged children. It's an open source resource we developed. Um, it's a much neglected area, we have to be honest. If adolescents and youth are underserved generally in crisis and conflict, they are especially so in the immediate onset of an emergency or a displacement where their particular needs, their particular risks and vulnerabilities that they suffer tend to be overlooked by programming that is either uh, targeting younger children or adults and they fall between in the gap. Um, this approach is um, very much around creating an enabling environment particularly through the with support to and the engagement with families. <clears throat> but the soft skills element focuses on the strengthening of life skills and support networks. Um, knowledge around um, biological responses to adversity is, is, is uh, deliberately and explicitly taught, and youth are given and adolescents those skills to identify and strengthen the positive support networks that they need. Um, with, with peers and with trusted adults. And there's a particular emphasis on core emotional skills, coping skills, setting goals, pursuing goals, and identifying healthy and uh, relationships. Um, combined, crucial this, with service learning projects. So that there's an opportunity to put this into practice um, and build pro-social attitudes uh, and, and create a better um, engagement, more positive engagement, between youth, adolescents, and, and the communities um, in which they, they live. So that was a, something of a whistle-stop tour, or the view from 37,000 feet, or whichever image you prefer. But um, I, I hope that's given you some sense of why we put social and emotional learning at the forefront of what we do, how we're seeking to uh, to apply it, where we hope to to go further in the future, or maybe come back to, and um, and of course, um, if you would like more information, please do get in touch. I can provide materials, and I can connect you with relevant colleagues. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, everybody, this is Matt. Can you hear me all right? Have a visual? We can hear you, but your video is not on, Matt. OK, let's start sharing. Extra step. Sorry. How about now? Yeah. Great. Thanks, Andrew, for that. And hello, everybody. Thanks for having me join you today. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Matt Strang with Mercy Corps. And just building on some of what Andrew was talking about earlier, um, the flow of my presentation will talk briefly about Mercy Corps' approach um, to soft skills in conflict and crisis settings, and then dive into two case studies, um, some work that we've been doing with adolescents uh, related to the Syria crisis, as well as some work that we have uh, recently just finished up in Somalia. So at Mercy Corps, um, we look at our youth development programming and our work with adolescents along this spectrum. Um, I think uh, for a long time we've had a strong focus and the, the industry has had a strong focus on child survival, zero to five, primary school uh, education. And increasingly at Mercy Corps we're trying to uh, emphasize a focus on adolescents, 10 to 19 years of age, really trying to unpack that decade of development as a critical decade when young people are making so many decisions, um, both on their own and with that enabling environment that was referenced earlier. Um, but that during the early adolescence, 10 to 14, and later adolescence, 15 to 19, uh, we're really pushing ourselves to think through how we provide adolescents with the right support at the right time. Um, and really is this being a, a stage and a phase when young people, adolescents, are being set up for success uh, later in life, 20 to 24 years of age, um, and setting them on a positive trajectory toward development. Um, so you can see you know, this upward trajectory towards safe and supported and skilled uh, young people, leading to secure and productive young people contributing to their community. Um, the alternative, or in many times in conflict and crisis settings, uh, without that support and the opportunity to develop and apply those skills, um, a downward trajectory towards isolation, vulnerability, um, and a lack of goal setting and opportunities into the future. Um, so this is how within our organization and externally we communicate the importance of our work 
And I think, uh, as Andrew was saying, an increasing focus on the adolescent neuroscience and brain development uh, as a critical time of, of intervention. Moving from that, um, just a visual of our theory of change of our youth work at, within Mercy Corps. Um, I think uh, this has helped us communicate not only internally but externally how we approach our programming. Um, and I think it aligns very well for those who are familiar with the positive youth development framework. Um, much of what is there is also within this visual theory of change. Just to talk through the theory of change from an organizational perspective, um, our work, you know, if we are intentional about finding and partnering with young people in fragile settings and they feel safe and supported, which is that gray circle around the red section, and if they learn relevant knowledge and skills to develop their personal resilience and create their own positive path forward, and they gain demand-driven job skills with linkages to safe, decent, and equitable work. This is the economic opportunities at the bottom of that red section. Um, and they meaningfully engage and connect with governance structures, so meaningful participation there to the, to the right. Um, if we do all these things, then we will have increased social, economic, and physical well-being, young people will, rather, and contribute to their communities' resilience. Um, so as, a, as an overarching uh, theory of change for our work, this is something that, that organizes our work. Um, that guides our work. And I think uh, much to what you've heard previously, in crisis and conflict settings, this gray circle of young people uh, feeling safe and supported as a critical foundational piece uh, that enables the opportunity for young people to learn knowledge and skills, to be able to activate those knowledge and skills through meaningful participation and uh, eventually through livelihood opportunities. So the two programs that I'm going to talk about today um, are one focused less on in-school education, but more on community-based non-formal education. That will be the theory response work. And then the Somalia work uh, is a combination of in-school education um, layered with civic engagement and civic participation. So moving to the Syria crisis. Um, for the past four years or so, Mercy Corps has engaged directly with adolescents and following um, some assessment work across the region in the Middle East and, and neighboring countries uh, where Syrian refugees were going, um, finding that adolescents were being neglected through not only the national level response but the international response by organizations like the Mercy Corps and, and our peers, as well as from donors' perspective. We felt that we needed to highlight um, adolescents as a critical group uh, for many of the reasons that I just uh, mentioned. This uh, set of programs across Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and inside Syria um, was community-based, non-formal education for adolescents. And it incorporated an approach that we call internally profound stress and attunement. Um, this is based on much of the neuroscience that Andrew just previously talked about and trying to put an understanding of that neuroscience into, into practice. Um, to date, across the region, we've worked with about 30,000 adolescents um, using this approach. And this is really established through youth centers in communities and training mentors as a key um, influence point uh, with young people. The focus has really been around psychological, psychosocial support and social emotional well-being, adolescent access to soft and hard skill development, as well as community engagement um, through mixed team action projects at the community level. Uh, finally, uh, working through at an individual level, goal setting and future planning has been a critical part of, of this particular design. Um, additionally, and in Jordan specifically, we've had the opportunity to do a, an intensive randomized control trial that has looked at levels of stress, um, cortisol, more specifically um, through hair samples of both Syrian adolescent refugees and their Jordanian peers. Um, so we're starting to learn, uh, much as Andrew had mentioned, there's a dearth of research being done in many of these crisis and conflict settings, but we're starting to learn a bit around um, the types of interventions that can reduce high levels or elevated levels of cortisol stress, as well as, and in, importantly, um, elevate very low levels of cortisol and stress, which is a sign of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so some of this research I'll talk about in a minute. Um, as well as the impact of stress on cognition or short-term memory, which I think has uh, great implication for the education field and, as I mentioned, um, foundational for much of the other higher order thinking skills that we want young people and adolescents to be able to uh, exhibit. Specifically, this program focused on the following soft skills. You can see them listed out here. I won't have time to go through all of them, but I wanted to go through a couple, specifically empathy and teamwork. Um, 
empathy not only towards others but uh, towards oneself. Importantly, recognizing that uh, much of the experience that Syrian refugees um, had gone through both inside Syria as well as part of their journey uh, to neighboring countries in those host communities. And um, beyond that, uh, also recognizing that Syrian refugees um, were not being the empathy towards Syrian refugees from um, their host community uh, peers. So empathy was a critical piece to that, um, and that was a focus of the program. We wanted to see changes in empathy, not only for uh, one's own self-reflection and growth, but as well um, to build social cohesion um, across these communities of Syrian refugees as well as their host community um, peers. To support the adolescents in building empathy, the program used what I referred to earlier as this profound stress and attunement model. Uh, this is based on the neuroscience. And importantly, um, what are some of the behaviors that are exhibited as a result of young people experiencing toxic and chronic stress uh, as a result of these changes in brain functioning? And some of those behaviors, um, as we mentioned previously, and critical soft skills are self-control, impulsivity emotional detachment, weakened critical thinking skills, and risk assessment. Um, so those were primarily a focus of much of the work um, to build empathy and really trying to, again, get young adolescents to recognize that these were normal responses to abnormal circumstances um, and that through that deeper understanding they were able to um, develop uh, empathy toward themselves and, and towards others. Importantly, and due to the emphasis of the work with mentors, is building mentor understanding of uh, young people, not only um, as young people demonstrate these behaviors, but recognizing that mentors as well had experienced much of this stress and had um, needed to identify their own triggers and their own behavioral um, responses to these adverse events and, and this stress. On the asset side, um, there was much of a focus on the asset-based approach through strength recognition. Um, young people identifying their own strengths and identifying the strengths of those um, that they were engaging with through the program and in their communities. And that through affirming um, others' strengths, um, recognizing how those strengths could be put into to action. The second soft skill that I wanted to focus on was teamwork. Um, the soft skill was developed by creating mixed teams in communities of, when I say mixed, I mean Syrian refugees as well as their host community peers, on shared areas of concern, shared community concerns, and how these pairs of, of, of young people in these mixed groups um, would develop interpersonal skills around communication and negotiation as they worked through the process of identifying what they wanted to improve in their communities and how they wanted to take action within those communities. So I think importantly, and as I'll get into more detail later through the Somali example, um, putting soft skills into application as an opportunity to build the agency related to the soft skill, and then ultimately giving young people and adolescents the opportunity to make the contribution through these community action projects um, that helps build their status, um, and as we'll find later, could reduce their propensity toward participation in or um, belief that they would support political violence. Some of the challenges that I wanted to highlight from this program in particular, um, one was, and I think we often struggle with what we are presented with and often read in the literature as very abstract um, soft skills, um, things like self-concept, things like self-esteem. Translating these concepts into practical behaviors, I think, is an ongoing challenge for many of us in the field, and it was for us in this program. Um, but how can we, and I think um, the work continues to need to focus on, what are demonstrated behaviors that reflect um, a presence of or an absence of these soft skills? So trying to move from the conceptual to the practical. Uh, one thing that we found has been very useful is role-playing um, many of these Skills. What does empathy look like? Allowing young people to demonstrate empathy toward one another, also to affirm and recognize each other's strengths. And through role playing and through observation of others demonstrating those skills, I think is an important way that we uh, have found that the uptake of these skills has increased. Um, it turns an abstract skill into an observed skill and allows for young people to model those skills. Um, so I think moving forward is we're all challenged to try and move very abstract terms into very concrete uh, demonstrations of behavior. Um, I think 
and you covered this to a certain degree, but the need for us to recognize that if you are using a mentoring approach, um, that mentors are often also affected by crisis and conflict, not only um, their social emotional well-being, but as well oftentimes their education has been uh, abbreviated, abbreviated or negatively impacted. Um, so the need to move beyond a one-off training of trainers, of mentors, and thinking that as a result they can then demonstrate and uh, allow for experiential application of soft skills with the young people that they're working with, um, but that we need much more intensive support toward mentors and ongoing engagement. The next challenge that I want to talk about is the integration of soft skills into applied training. Um, oftentimes we hear from communities where we work and oftentimes the parents, um, especially for refugee communities, is the need to have some concrete skill development, right? Some type of vocational skill or some skill that will provide a young person with a concrete opportunity in the future. These are many times and I should have mentioned earlier, out-of-school adolescents who aren't engaging in education. So the desire from the family's perspective and the young person's perspective to have a concrete skill, which presents the challenge of layering many of the soft skills into the um, hard skill implementation or delivery. Uh, we are asking now a technical expert and a hard skill, whether that be um, computer programming or whether that be carpentry uh, or other hard skills that young people are seeking, to now layer in a soft skill um, on top of that. And I think the, the demand uh, that that puts on mentors is sometimes we underestimate that and we need to think through creatively from a design perspective um, as well as how we evaluate how effectively are soft skills um, being implemented through hard skill training um, and, and looking deeply into that. And then finally, I would just say that, and this is a theme that will come up in a minute when we talk through some of the uh, the lessons learned is really around um, the enabling environment. We talked that through as part of the PYD, Positive Youth Development Framework. Um, due to the emphasis that we put through this program on mentors, um, I think we did neglect and have now right-sized our support and engagement of caregivers. Um, we need to recognize that with soft skill development, the application needs to be consistent and constant. That it's not just the time during the engagement with the project activities but how can we engage with caregivers? And I don't think we did a good enough job early on in this program engaging caregivers to reinforce that soft skill development and application um, outside of the mentoring relationship and the peer-to-peer -peer relationship. So really an emphasis on caregiver support there. And then early in the program, these community youth centers um, being less accessible to girls due to limited mobilities that adolescent girls often face in conflict and crisis, and the need to engage adolescent girls to identify those locations in their communities um, and obviously engage their parents directly in this as well, um, what they can access, when they can access those spaces, and how those services and that asset um, skill development can be delivered in a more um, safe and accessible way for adolescent girls. Finally, lessons learned. I think, you know, as I mentioned, expanding our work with the enabling environment, the engagement with caregivers. Um, this has since been added as, a, as an important um, group of activities within this program. And then I think, you know, building on what Andrew was saying earlier and what we experienced in this program is, you know, there's a huge appetite among adolescents and young people and their parents and caregivers, mentors as well, in understanding neuroscience. So I think we're challenged to translate the neuroscience into practice. Um, but as we did that and as young people had a deeper understanding of their normal responses to abnormal circumstances, uh, there was a deep uh, appreciation and I think a recognition that uh, what they were experiencing was was normal and it really reinforced the ability to develop that empathy that we were seeking to develop through the program. And then some of the research that we're doing currently has shown, you know, as a result of, of this intervention and I think encouraging results that, you know, those high levels of, of cortisol have been reduced by about a third um, in the intervention group compared to a control group and that those low levels of cortisol have been increased by about 60% uh, in the intervention group compared to a control group. So encouraging signs, moderate uh, impact, but encouraging. Um, so I think where I'm getting at with this lesson learned is oftentimes in the past we've focused on, focused on past exposure to adverse events, and that has been the primary um, indicator of vulnerability and risk. I think we need to start to incorporate more and more regular uh, and current present-day assessments of stress 
and both self-report and if the opportunity is there to confirm that with biomarkers. But that's expensive and difficult. We found that uh, the biomarker research that we've done has um, validated many of the self-report, that those tend to be accurate measures, the self-report measures of stress. Um, that current stress levels are actually, you know, a stronger indicator of ability to uh, perform well on cognitive tests and short-term memory uh, than exposure to adverse events in the past. Just moving over to the other program, the Somalia Youth Leader Learners Initiative. Um, this was a program uh, USAID funded in Somalia in multiple regions, um, Somaliland, Puntland, and South Central Somalia. And the objective of the goal of the program was really to reduce instability through increased education and civic participation um, opportunities for Somali youth age 15 to 24. Um, in terms of the education focus, that was really around construction and rehabilitation of schools, uh, training of teachers, and development of community education centers, committees rather, sorry. Um, in terms of the civic engagement components, um, students developed first-hand experience through a training on civic engagement that was delivered through secondary schools. And through those, um, young leaders were trained on civic engagement and then conflict management and were then provided an opportunity to go out into the communities with uh, a group of their peers that they had organized and implement community service projects through um, the civic engagement component. The soft skills highlighted through this program, um, as you can see on the screen, communication and conflict management, team building, community mobilization, and leadership. Um, the one that I'd like to focus on now is communication and conflict management, as this was in a conflict setting, post-conflict setting, ongoing in some, con in some regions. Um, and how this was delivered was really through a guide for youth-led civic engagement activities um, in secondary schools by young leaders. Uh, who are trained. And I think importantly, um, when we unpack conflict management, uh, we're talking about effective communication, we're talking about negotiation skills, we're talking about young people's ability to understand what conflict is, to identify it, uh, the enable, to be enabled to understand the causes and consequences of conflict, and to equip youth with the conflict management and peace building skills. Um, and finally, to help them understand, and within this context, the Islamic approach to conflict resolution, um, which was very localized and contextualized in this case. Um, these skills were then applied through these action projects at the community level um, as a way to, again, and I think importantly called out in the PYDA framework, is building the agency and the ability to make a contribution, applying those through community action projects. Some of the challenges through this program were um, this program took place right around the Arab Spring in the Middle, in the Middle East, 2011. Um, there was a lot of uh, concern and mistrust by the government over young people self-mobilizing and self-organizing to address community-level concerns. Um, so there was some reluctance at the ministry level to incorporate um, community mobilization into some of the educational work that was being done at the secondary school level. Um, and then, you know, at a, from a formal education perspective, there was um, some reluctance and a lack of value or recognition of why civic engagement and community mobilization skills um, would be needed above and beyond the traditional um, curriculum focus on civic education. Um, so that was, um, took a bit of persuasion and eventually, as I'll mention in the lessons learned, was incorporated into the, uh, the formal curriculum. Um, but that was a challenge throughout. Um, the enabling environment to sustain civic engagement and some of the soft skills incorporated in that, I think it was critical for us to find a structure within communities that would sustain this and continue to, to engage young people in this type of work. Um, and initially, um, it was difficult to find, whether it be at a school or community organizations or the ministry, uh, who that entity might be going forward. And then just something somewhat unique to Somalia is needing to be responsive to three different political entities. You had uh, multiple entities who needed to approve and confirm um, the formalization of this um, civic engagement work within the program, Somaliland being one, Puntland being a regional government, and the federal government of Somalia, um, all were key stakeholders at the government level. The lessons learned and some of the research that, that led to these lessons, I think uh, initially um, the need to build on the soft skills through the action projects um, and integrate that into the school curriculum was something that took a long time but eventually was successful, uh, lended itself to ongoing sustainability. 
So that, that integration into the formal um, curriculum was a key lesson learned and success. But more importantly, and I think um, where I'd like to spend more time is some of the research done on this program really focused and I think reinforced what positive youth development, the integrated approach to positive youth development um, aims to accomplish is that the combination, and we did some research on this looking at what were the effects of education on young people's participation in violence and support of political violence uh, alone, and then what was the impact of education plus civic and community engagement on, on participation in violence and um, support of political violence. And what we found was, was pretty interesting. I think we found that education alone, while it um, reduced young people's participation in political violence by 16%, um, it actually increased support for political violence by 11%. So it's a surprising finding on the increase of support for political violence, but a decrease in actual participation in political violence. Um, in unpacking that a bit, you know, we think through education if we're taking an integrated approach and understand um, development from a young person's perspective, education is one piece of the pie. It's one piece of the puzzle. And oftentimes in places like Somalia where services and opportunities are scarce, um, education can be perceived as raising expectations um, and increasing grievances and frustration. Um, so education alone uh, not being the answer. Um, however, the educational environment being a protective environment that reduced isolation, um, that reduced the likelihood of being recruited into um, political violent movements and therefore decreased uh, direct participation in political violence. When we analyzed both the education and the civic engagement, we actually found positive outcomes on both. Uh, we saw a reduction in participation in political violence by 14% and a reduction in support for political violence by 20%. So I think a real important reminder that we need to think through integrated positive youth development programming and oftentimes these soft skills need to be done as a package, they're interrelated um, in order for us to have the ultimate intended impact in this case for this program, increasing stability. So I think I will end there and pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you. So hello everybody. I assume that you can both hear me and see me, although the lighting is not the best, but I hope it's I hope it's okay. Am I seen and heard? Yes, you I guess not. Okay, awesome, brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, hello everybody. I'm Solvay and I'm um, here speaking on behalf of, of, um, of Search for Common Ground. Um, Search for Common Ground is, of course, as, as, as many of you know, um, uh, the world's largest uh, peace-building uh, organization working in um, working in, uh, I think it is, what is it, 45 countries um, uh, around the world with 650 staff, and I'm not going to pretend that in this in this presentation here that I'll be able to do justice to all of the work that that all of our all of our teams do around the world on on, on skills development. Um, but I work for the the children youth team, and what we do is we provide support to our field offices and how they work with uh, with children and youth and. And I've, I've been with, with the children youth team at Search for Common Ground since, since last December, but before that I, I, uh, I led uh, the United Network of Young Peace Builders, which is the global network of youth-led peace building organizations. So my background is very much within this whole youth participation, youth leadership space. And, um, and so I, I thought I would take that angle a little bit to my uh, presentation here today. Uh, to try to complement a little bit what, what the other speakers were, were saying and, and bring in something slightly different to the conversation, perhaps, hopefully. Um, so, first of all, I just want to take a moment to, to mention that, um, that within, you know, when we talk about youth in the context of peace building and youth in the context of, of conflict-affected uh, uh, settings, there is 
uh, traditional discourse, if you like, which has tended to be quite harmful to youth agency and young people's ability to, to act in their communities. Um, this is a discourse where young men have traditionally been seen as perpetrators of violence. They've been seen as a group which needs you know, to be kept at bay. Society needs to be protected from them. And at the same time, young women have been primarily understood to be victims of violence who need to be protected from violence. And in both of these discourses, and of course both of these can be very true, um, there are a lot of young people who engage in violence and there are also a lot of young people who are affected by violence, but, um, but nevertheless, uh, these discourses, they, they really minimize and, and uh, uh, you know, deny, if you like, the, the positive agency that young people have, their ability to make a positive uh, impact in their communities. And um, and that's over the years been quite harmful, but there's also increasing recognition of this, and there's increasing sort of increase. Yeah, I, I guess you could say there's a bit of a shift going on at the moment in in how young people are being talked about and understood. Um, but I wanted maybe to to see what does this mean when we talk about skills development. What does this, you know? attempt, if you like, to shift to a way, to shift to a place where we maybe understand young people and their agency in a more positive way. What does that mean for um, for skills development? And, and I'd maybe like to pose a bit of a challenge to uh, to those of us who belong to the, I guess, the so-called international community, if you like. Um, but first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the background to all of this and a little bit about um, young people as peace builders, I suppose. Um, last year, we at SEARCH, we did a, a, a large uh, survey of youth-led organizations that work on peace and security. Um, we surveyed around 400 organizations, and what we found not very surprisingly is that young people are very actively engaged in peace building and in conflict transformation at the community level. But what we also found and was maybe more interesting, if you like, or not, if, if not necessarily surprising, but, but also not necessarily a given, is that skills development is actually a, a core part of what young people are doing um, in the field of peace building and conflict transformation. Um, this is often happening at the peer-to-peer -peer level with uh, with young people supporting their, you know, people of their own age, uh, peers in their own communities and, and skills development. And this can be things like uh, employability related skills, um, working with uh, young people who are disengaging with violent groups. It can be things like leadership skills, and there's, there's a variety of examples of this from all over the world. Um, we also see that a lot of young people actually work with people who are younger than themselves. They, they engage with younger youth and children, also in skills development, um, in non-formal education especially, but also sometimes with informal education. And what we noticed is that um, one of the main strengths, really, of, of young people in doing this type of work is that they tend to have a unique position within their own communities in terms of being able to reach other youth groups, which may be we working for international NGOs or for you know governments, government agencies, um, or, or different members of this uh, frequently uh, mentioned international community. Um, we don't often have that same level of access necessarily. But at the same time, what was interesting is that we found in this in the survey that that a lot of young people who are actually engaged in, in this type of work, when they're asked about the challenges they face, of course there are a variety of different challenges that, that are very context specific, but one thing that is really mentioned by young people around the world is, is that they feel challenged by a lack of education, skills, and technical training. So um, they, um, they are really looking for, looking for additional support in, in developing their skills. I noted in the chat window that at least one person seems to be having trouble hearing me. If others are also having the same 
trouble, maybe I will turn off my camera to try to increase the bandwidth as I see the, the picture isn't that great anyway. Um, apologies for that. So I would like to propose that as international actors engaged in peace building, we actually have a responsibility um, to respond to the need that young people have for their skills development. But we have a responsibility to do so in a way which doesn't just, you know, involve working on youth as a target group, but that we should also work with youth. Um, Yesterday, uh, the, the Independent Progress Study on Youth Peace and Security, with, uh, um, which was written uh, by Graham Simpson at the, at the request of the UN Secretary General, uh, was released yesterday. Um, and, and one really good quote in there um, from a young person from, from Western Central Africa um, was, youth shouldn't be on the table, they should be around the table. And this is something that I have to say, you know, th th this is a really good <laughs> phrasing of something that a lot of young people say a lot of the time when we try to engage with them. And I think when it comes to our work on skills development, we have to try to listen to these types of uh, comments and suggestions that are being made to us. And we should... Um, we should, we should we should really engage in skills development not as something that we have to do you know towards youth but as something that we should work on with youth and this is tricky you know I'm not going to pretend that 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 I have here some magical you know method or magical solution for for it um, I'll I'll skip this slide just in, since we 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 don't have a lot of time but I wanted to just bring in one um, one example which some of you may be familiar familiar with. Um, of, of a way in which we've tried at search to integrate this approach of working with youth rather than working on youth and thus also developing young people's skills through the work that we're doing which is perhaps partly but not only focused on skills development and one example of how we've been able to do this is um, by uh, mainstreaming really a, a, a methodology for for research, which is called listening and learning, um, into all of the all of the types of you know evidence gathering that we do around youth com the youth communities that we engage, this methodology um, builds on on participatory action research to um, to say that you know we should. Instead of going in and doing research in an extractive way, we should train young people as researchers so that they can themselves collect uh, and analyze uh, data from their own communities. Recently, for example, we did this um, with a series of consultations that we held with, or which were focus group discussions essentially with, with hard to reach young people in, in, in five different countries. Um, in, in this you know, in, it's an international research project, but what we did is we had one international researcher who was coordinating the overall process, but then in each country we trained up teams of, I, I think it was around six young people to act as researchers in their own communities. Now, what this does is it provides us with, you know, valuable data, and, and of course from the research perspective it's a, it's, a, it's a very valuable method to get closer to the communities we're trying to engage with, but it also enables us to develop the skills of, of, uh, of young people from those communities, to develop their leadership skills and communication skills by making them actors and not just recipients of our work. Um, and that's an approach that we're trying to take in, in, in our work at Search for Common Ground, but, but as I say, it is, it is tricky. And before wrapping up, I just wanted to mention a few of the challenges um, of, of you know using youth participation as a method to address skills development. Now, the first challenge, of course, is that it's difficult to use this to address uh, large groups. Um, here we're of course talking about individual engagement most of the time. At the same time, I think it is possible to design programs in a way which, for example, requires um, 
or, or, or encourages at least the, the young people who participate to go back to their communities and share what they've learned. And, and I think one thing that's also important there is, is to um, be careful in identifying young people who are in a position to do that, for example, young people who are active within youth groups or who are community leaders and so on. Um, but that, of course, comes, brings me to the next challenge, which is, which is the difficulty of, in, of, of ensuring that we're not just you know, perpetuating um, the status of elite groups, of elite youth, um, which, is a, which is a continuous problem within, um, you know, as, as we work with young people and, and for, for youth movements and youth groups, that, that, that there are these elite groups, if you like, that have perhaps access to resources and power but are not representative of their communities. Um, and these are ongoing challenges to which, again, I, I, I don't feel that I, I have the, the, you know, the perfect answers to, but I think by very careful program design, by very careful um, uh, identification of the young people that we work with, and by ensuring that, that uh, we are constantly asking ourselves these questions along the way, I think um, we can at least uh, avoid falling into some of the traps. Now, I'm very conscious of the time um, limits here in this webinar, so I've tried to be a little bit quick so that there's also time for the Q&A because I've seen so many interesting questions popping up in the, in the chat window. So I'll wrap it up there. Um, I hope at least that I've given everybody some food for thought, um, and I look forward to, yeah. Thank you, Toby, and thank you, Andrew and, and Matt for, and Nina for, uh, for your presentation today. As uh, Toby uh, mentioned, we had received uh, several questions. Uh, we won't have time to address all of them, but I understand that uh, we will be able to forward the questions to the presenters and then ask them to uh, reply by uh, writing and then uh, we will share the, the responses with uh, all participants. Um, so we have a few questions. Uh, one of them, and it could be asked, uh, answered by any of you guys, uh, is coming from Laura. Are soft skills sustainable? Uh, once learned, they become personal uh, do they become personal characteristics? Uh, this is Matt with Mercy Corps. I think it's a great question. I um, I want to pull from research that shows that it is, but I, I I don't have it at the at the ready at the moment. I mean, I think it's really a really interesting question. I think soft skills um, once practiced and you know used on a regular basis are more likely to be adopted as as characteristics. So I think the need to repeat and apply obviously is critically important, and I think that's been uh, emphasized in some of the, the positive youth development learning literature. Um, but I think what also would be interesting is just to think through how soft skills are contextual, right? Certain soft skills can be used in certain contexts when a young person feels safe to use them, and there might be other contexts where young people struggle to use those soft skills even though they're effective at using them in, in other contexts. So I think it's also a very fluid concept that, you know, one young person develops soft skills over their lifetime and they might be able to apply them or not in certain contexts. I don't have a, a, a satisfactory answer there, but I just wanted to share some thoughts. I don't know if the other speakers do. Uh, this, is, this is Andrew. Um, I have to agree. I think it's a, a fascinating and very important question, but I, but I feel that there really is a dearth of, of evidence around this. Um, I think this might be something that will change, certainly in, in um, higher income environments um, in the fairly near term, but um, but in other environments not. And, and I would say, you know, a lot of it is about how do you turn these these first of all rather abstract concepts into something that uh, that um, a, a habit, a characteristic, a a routine behavior and approach. I, I'm afraid, I rather imagine it has a lot to do with sustaining and enabling environment. Um, but also providing that opportunity for application. Um, but um, I think this has to be absolutely has to be explored, and it's a, it's a key question. 
Thank you, Matthew. And we also have a question for Foldy. Foldy, uh, Claudia Taylor asks, how do you make sure you don't end up working with uh, with the privileged youth as opposed to those who really lack uh, communication skills, are isolated, marginalized, uh, et cetera? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. That's indeed one of the one of the challenges that I was mentioning earlier. This 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 you know risk of 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 working primarily with elite youth and thus you know basically perpetuating a cycle where it's always the same young people who have access to the same types of training that you know have access to resources who have access, who are able to get their voices heard and 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 so on and then you really end up missing out on a on a lot of uh, you know, on, on working with maybe the people who who need it the most. Um, I think, and 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 I mean, you know, we when we go into a community and as as um, as outside actors who come in and 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 are are trying to support, I think we have a very big responsibility to try to understand the communities that we're coming in to try to understand the dynamics, for example, of the youth um, populations that we're working with. Um, and I think this is this is really the the, the um, yeah this this is our responsibility I suppose and and we have to try to map out you know who are the young people who have access who are the young people who have power who are the young people who don't and what are our entryways into working with them and very often I think those entryways are not doing it ourselves not coming in as you know as an outsider. Um, but rather finding people who are able to bridge those, uh, you know, the, what can sometimes seem like a very distant gap from between, let's say, an international NGO or an international development agency and um, a young person in a marginalized community uh, or, or, or a young person who, who faces some sort of uh, barriers to, 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 to uh, social participation. I think often we are not the right people to do that, but we can find in the communities we work, often other young people who are able to 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 build such bridges, um, often um, other community members, uh, community leaders, and that's one of those things where you know I, I, it, it it would be senseless to try to say there is one solution apply it everywhere because that depends so much on the context. But um, but I think the, the the key is really understanding, you know, what are the dynamics of the youth in the community that 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 we're trying to engage with, and how can we, yeah, and you know, designing basically into our strategies, into our approaches, ways in which to make sure, you know, way, ways to make sure that 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 we aren't just engaging with the with the youth who uh, who are already privileged. Uh, Great. Thank you, Toby. And I know that we are uh, about to finish, so I don't know if we just have a few more minutes to ask the last question and is directed to Andrew. Andrew, I'm going to ask, what can we do in the context for radical groups are against youth education? I'm sorry, who was the question addressed to and could you repeat uh, it? That was uh, directed to you. And the question is, what can be okay. done in the context where radical groups are against youth education? What can be done when radical youth are, and then your audio dropped off. Oh, are against youth education. Are against youth education. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done in community-based interventions if that was a, a, a barrier to um, young people engaging in school and obviously if you had um, those who were potentially more radicalized outside of school and not accessing education where you might want to access them is more through a community-based approach um, so you know Mercy Corps is doing some programming in Jordan related to this and it's very much um, working on the enabling environment I think it's uh, thinking through what the root causes of young people joining radical movements are, trying to really disentangle what the motivations are in that case and try and uh, offset those with other incentives. Um, and also through counter-narratives. Um, I think, you know, trying to communicate uh, 
um, you know, and exposing some of what might not be um, uh, as true as what might be stated um, through radical recruitment. So I think that community-based approaches that look at the role of caregivers, the role of mothers in particular, I think we found in Jordan when young people were crossing over into Syria and becoming part of uh, radicalized movements, uh, mothers were very effective in, in requesting those their sons to return. Um, so those influential people in a young person's life, I think, was a key piece. So there's a lot you can do outside the formal education system, um, but I think there's also a lot that can be done inside the formal education system, and a counter-narrative uh, approach might be important if education is being perceived as um, something that increased the risk of young people or was not um, supported by, by radical movements and would put young people at greater risk. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, we definitely have run out of time, so I'm giving the, uh, the slides back to Lindsay. Lindsay? Thank you, Olga. Thanks to Hillary, Olga, Nina, Andrew, Matt, Salvi, and your respective organizations for your presentations today. If you're looking for more information on this and other youth development topics, please visit youthpower.org, join one or more of our communities of practice, and be in touch with us about sharing your best practices. You can email us at info at youthpower.org. We'd also like to highlight our current grant under contract and to encourage you to share the newly launched Young Women Transform Prize. Prizes of $15,000 to $35,000 will be awarded to grassroots youth-led or youth-serving organizations and lower middle-income countries to address long-standing barriers to young women's employment. Please visit youthpower.org slash 2018-prize for more information and share this widely with your network. Thank you for joining today's webinar. The recording, slides, and Q&A from today's event will be shared with all registr registrants. Please visit youthpower.org for more. We will now share a short survey about today's webinar. Have a great rest of your day.